Now that we've worked backwards and designed a retrosynthesis of Demerol, it's time to write the synthesis out in the forward direction. And we do that using what's called a synthetic scheme. Now, a synthetic scheme is different from a reaction mechanism. That's an important point to state right off the bat. In a reaction mechanism, we depict reactive intermediates, all the stable species between reactants and products in a chemical reaction. In a synthetic scheme, we only depict synthetic intermediates, stable compounds that are isolated between synthetic manipulations. That distinction can be subtle in some cases, and in some cases you'll see that violated with intermediates that are not isolated written in brackets, but generally speaking, we only list the starting materials and reagents and products at each step of the synthesis in a synthetic scheme. The first thing I wanted to do was just revisit the retrosynthesis briefly here. Recall that we worked to Demerol back to this benzyl chloride compound, CO2 and ethanol, and this dihalide containing the amine, the, the methylamine functional group built into it. To write the synthesis in the forward direction as a synthetic scheme, we first start with kind of the first reaction from the simplest starting material, which in this case is the benzyl chloride. Recall that that was the last step of our retrosynthesis, where we end the retrosynthesis, of course, we start the synthesis. That's fairly natural. Now the first, or last, depending on how you think about it, transform that we engaged was the Grignard transform. And the idea there is to create an organometallic reagent and then hit that with CO2 and acid workup to establish the carboxylic acid. The important point in general when you're doing synthetic schemes is now we need to think about the specific reagents to use to accomplish our synthetic goals in the forward direction. And so we need to start thinking a little bit more specifically here and looking, for example, at whether our reaction conditions will mess with other functional groups in the starting material. So for example, here to accomplish the Grignard reaction, we're going to start by treating with magnesium metal, and then we're going to treat with carbon dioxide. And we haven't isolated anything yet. So we can write all of these steps on a single line. And then finally, we're going to use acidic workup, aqueous acid generally, and so we can write that as H3O plus and H2O to protonate the anion that forms when the Grignard reagent adds to CO2. And before writing the product, it's worth considering whether any of these reaction conditions will mess with the benzene ring or the phenyl ring that's built into this substrate. And the answer in this case is no. And, and generally speaking, unless it's desirable to hit two functional groups at once in a synthesis, you only want to hit one group at a time. If you anticipate side reactions occurring or reactions of groups that you don't want to happen, then you have what's called a functional group compatibility issue. The reaction conditions you're using are not compatible with the functional groups that you want to stay put in the starting material. Here, thankfully, we don't have that issue. And while we can absolutely and probably should think about some of the intermediate species that are formed in this reaction, for example, the Grignard reagent itself, and we may want to think about how this adds to carbon dioxide and a nucleophilic addition type step, something like this, right? None of this is necessary to include in a synthetic scheme. We can advance right to the final product isolated after this aqueous workup and purification, which in this case is going to be the corresponding carboxylic acid, where we've replaced the chlorine group with a carboxylic acid group. From here, the next step was esterification, converting that carboxylic acid group into an ester, specifically an ethyl ester using ethanol and acid. And so something like ethanol, and here it's good practice to choose a specific acid Anything, any strong acid will work fine, H2SO4 or HCl, either of those will work fine. And this will get us to the corresponding ethyl ester since we used ethanol as the solvent here. It's optional, though totally fine and, and again probably helpful to write minus H2O to indicate that water is lost in this step as well. From here, we've established the ester and phenyl functional groups. Now we need to functionalize or modify this alpha carbon, replacing these hydrogens with the two alkyl groups built into the cyclic amine functionality there. And to do this, we're going to think about turning this into a nucleophile and hitting with this bifunctional dihalide reactant. And so we can accomplish this by using, for example, two equivalents of LDA. It's good to include the two here just to make the stoichiometry clear. And then this alkyl halide. And this, in fact, will get us right to Demerol. So I'll go ahead and redraw the structure of Demerol with that phenyl ring abbreviated and the ester 
abbreviated, but with two equivalents of strong base, we can make both carbon-carbon bonds at the same time, and we've arrived at Demerol. So notice again that in the forward direction, we've supplied specific reagents to accomplish each reaction in the forward direction. And we're thinking about things like functional group compatibility, and although it didn't come up here, stereoselectivity are the reactions we're using selective for the diastereomers or enantiomers that we want to produce en route to the target. Before we leave Demerol, I did want to emphasize this idea that in synthesis, there's more than one way to skin a cat. So this synthetic route that we devised really was built from common reactions from organic chemistry one and two. This is not how Demerol is synthesized in practice. However, the way it is synthesized can be easily understood using the reactions of, of sophomore organic chemistry as well. And it's highly analogous to the approach we took. And so I did want to briefly touch on that so that you can see some similarities between these two routes. In fact, the route that's, that's used in practice to actually manufacture and mass produce this chemical starts from a benzyl halide, let's just call it benzyl chloride, and instead of installing a carboxylic acid, starts with the installation of a nitrile using something like sodium cyanide in an SN2 reaction. And so conceptually, it's, it's actually similar to the Grignard in that we're making a carbon-carbon bond using one of the carbons in a plus three oxidation state, you might say. Notice that the nitrile functionality is at the same oxidation level. If I just draw out the nitrile here quickly, this carbon is at the same oxidation level as the carboxylic acid carbon up here. And so the nitrile and carboxylic acid groups are analogous in that respect. The nitrile is also electron withdrawing, and that means that we can use it just as well to generate negative charge and stabilize negative charge at this alpha carbon. This carbon here is an alpha carbon with respect to the nitrile group. That's nice. That means we can take an analogous approach to what we did above and think about generating an enolate stru type structure there. And so here again, we could do something similar to what we did in this step, hitting with two equivalents of a strong base. For example, lithium diisopropyl amid is strong enough to do this. And then hitting with, in fact, the exact same dihalide compound with that methyl amino functional group built in. I'm actually gonna swing this around here to give us a little bit more room to work. This gives us a compound that is analogous to Demerol but contains a cyano group where we find the ester group in the final product. And to get from the cyano group to the ester group is really just a functional group interchange process. And to accomplish that, we first use acidic hydrolysis of the nitrile that's going to be acid and water, and using H3O plus from my perspective is fine, although you could choose an acid of your choice, H2SO4, um, HCl, nitric acid, whatever is your favorite. And actually, we don't even need the one here since this is going to be one synthetic manipulation. This will produce the corresponding carboxylic acid. And then as we did above, we can convert that carboxylic acid into an ester using Fischer esterification conditions with solvent quantities of ethanol, since we want to make an ethyl ester, and an acid of your choice using something like H3O plus here is totally fine, or picking an acid like HCl is also totally fine. And again, this will result in the loss of water. And in fact, this goes right to Demerol, which is our target. So these two synthetic roots are, are highly analogous in that they both make use of this key enolate type reactivity of this alpha carbon, a carbon where negative charge is stabilized. We generate negative charge by deprotonating at that carbon and then hitting with this dihalide in both cases to establish those two key carbon-carbon bonds in the target, in Demerol. And so in the reverse direction, thinking about the transforms, those are really key disconnection transforms. We can almost think of it as one transform just applied in two different contexts to establish these two key carbon-carbon bonds at the quaternary carbon. So those were critical disconnection transforms. Another critical disconnection was this bond between the alpha carbon and the carbonyl carbon in the case of our first route, or the cyanide carbon in the case of the industrial route. That bond was disconnected through an SN2 transform in the bottom case, and a Grignard transform in the top case to get back to a simpler substrate the corresponding alkyl halide in both cases. Everything else you see here really can be thought of as a functional group manipulation. The conversion of the cyano group into an ester, although it happens over two steps, is really just a functional group interchange process. There's no change in the oxidation level of this carbon, in fact. It's plus three 
in the cyanide, and it's plus three in the carboxylic acid and in the ester. All we're doing, in essence, is exchanging carbon-nitrogen bonds for carbon-oxygen bonds, and that's classic functional group interchange.